Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Craig. I am one of the pastors at Harvest, um, where Melissa attended, and along with Rusty, and uh, just wanted to open us up with just a few verses from God's Word, and then, of course, uh, some prayer as well. And first, I just want to thank everybody for coming. I know if you're here, uh, Melissa had an impact on your life. And if it was anything similar to the short impact that she had on mine, I'm sure you left happier than when you walked into the room the first time you met her. And every time after that, she was full of life, full of that sweet Southern charm and all that good stuff, even when she was um, in pain and not feeling well as well. Um, and to begin this service, I would like just to read a few passages from God's word in an attempt to set the theme of hope and trust in the Lord for this service. Um, and I want to do this because it was this, uh, the theme of her life, right? A theme of trusting and hoping in a good, good father. And she lived her life well because of it. And when it was time to pass, she passed well because of it as well. And first I want to read from Revelation 21.4 where it says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. So as we're here, as we're talking and we're celebrating her life, um, there's going to be sadness. There's going to be tears in this room as we hear about memories and other things like that. Uh, but not her tears, right? She is in glory. She is doing well. We can have hope in that. So we can grieve and be sad, but not for her, just for ourselves and the struggle and the void that it's left, not having her here. Romans 14, 8 tells us, for if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. This is comforting because we know that she is still the Lord's. And finally, I would like to read a verse that many of you probably know. You could almost recite it with me if you wanted to. I'm not going to ask you to. But it says, For God so loved the world, this is John 3, 16, that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Melissa held firm to God's word. She did. And I pray that as we talk about her today and give glory to God, um, that his word could also be a comfort to you, that his presence could be a comfort to you because today as we celebrate the life of Melissa, we can rest assured that she is in eternity with that same God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, God, thank you so much um, for your hope on difficult days. And uh, today is a difficult day. Um, today we say goodbye to um, a friend. Um, she went by many names, um, you know, but um, whether it was wife, whether it was friend, um, but God, um, today we just get to sit and we get to celebrate. We get to hear about her. We get to celebrate where she is. And though it might be hard, we can have a hope. And God, I just pray that that's exactly what we can have as we listen to what Josh has to say. If there's any friends and family that are going to talk, we can listen to what they have to say and we can rest in hope because of the way that Melissa lived her life. Um, God, that we know she loved you and she, was, she is with you in heaven right now for eternity exactly where she needs to be. And we're thankful for a loving Father who gives us that hope and that reassurance. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Greg. Can you hear me? Kind of, yes, maybe. Am I on? Okay, good deal. I am Josh Bitework, and I'm listed as the pastor, but I'm actually the director of Love in Action, and a lot of this crowd is Love in Action people, so if you're a volunteer or staff member, thanks for coming. For everybody else, thanks for being here as well. Uh, but what that means that, I don't know, I was a pastor at some point in my life, but Melissa and I work together. That's where I come from, so the connection is just one of just that relationship, and I'm honored to be here as well. We're going to start with a time of sharing, so you're going to have the opportunity, and I just want you to think and look within yourself. If you have some story, and it can be a humorous story, honestly, or it can be a heart-touching story, but this was a person that is just, what do you even say about Melissa Woolley? i got to tell you, over the last two, three, four weeks, as I've watched this process, and over the last few days, 
as we've gone through the, the planning for this event and just kind of looking back on her life, I have cried and laughed at the same time, a few different times. A few weeks, uh, probably three weeks ago, I'm thinking, I visited in the ICU and I knocked on the front door of the, the, the waiting room or the, the hospital in there, just kind of knocked on the door and I was kind of having a rough day and I just leaned in and I said, um, you know, I'm having a bad day, I'm here to be cheered up. And Melissa just started laughing out loud and she would, she honestly cheered me up for the next 25 minutes as we talked. I mean, that's the, the, the human being that she was and that she is. And so that's just a gift. I'm going to read for you just from the obituary. And this is a bit of what we know about her life, but so much of what's important might be in your minds and in your memories. And Rusty has just offered this time for anyone who wants to come up over the next few minutes and share right up here in the front. And so if you'd like to do that, after I'm done reading, you can, you can share. Melissa Amanda Woolley, age 66, so young, went home to her Lord and Savior on Tuesday, August 3rd, 2021, after a brief battle with cancer. She was born January 7, 1955, in Bessemer, Alabama, outside of Birmingham, correct? To Preston and Ruth Little, and married Frank Cambra, Rusty Woolley, and I didn't know your name was Frank until I read this, on April 4, 2015, in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Melissa was the store manager for Love, Inc., and they got the name wrong, like we all get the name wrong all the time, so that's great. Love in Action of Spring Lake, and loved her job and coworkers. She attended the Harvest Bible Church in Spring Lake, and Melissa loved life. She loved rescuing anything, whether bugs, plants, or items that could be repurposed. I think she did that by purchasing a few things from our resale store. Um, she repurposed things all over. When I was at the house, I think I recognized a few things. <laughs> she took it as a challenge to always speak to a stranger and would always make a, a new friend. Most of all, she loved the Lord, and she loved her family, and she loved her friends. I'm going to stop there and I'm going to invite you. Anybody want to come on up and share just a brief memory or a story? And if not, I'll have plenty to say, so don't worry too much. <laughs> so all of us have really good memories of her. Um, <clears throat> I will not cry, <laughs> not in this, because it's good stuff. Um, she uh, and Rusty and I and Wayne went to a few concerts together, which was so much fun. She's a fun lady. Um, I think we went to Toby Mac and Bust and Move, <laughs> um, went to Mercy Me, um, and she loved music, and so she just embodied that fun. Um, we had popcorn Fridays at the office, and we would make popcorn and smell the whole office up, and everyone would get mad because they were hungry for popcorn. Um, and then the one story that I think defined it for me the most for her was um, when I was I had an office I had an office in the front of the lobby, and when she was a receptionist, um, she would talk, and when she talks, her face spills out. And there was, um, I don't even know who it was, I just heard it. But there was a little boy, I think, who it, is who it was. And I overheard her say, um, do you love Jesus? And I, I heard little, you know, I heard toys and stuff, and, and all I heard her say was, I love Jesus. <laughs> In her y'all, it was amazing. Um, excuse me. Um, she just had a way of showing her love for Jesus. And I just knew after listening to her, I just thought, man, someday I want to be like Melissa and be able to just spill over that love. So our condolences.
Oh, isn't this just the most adorable? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and look at this. This came in before I came in today. It's like, isn't this just so cute? And that was before she took things out of the cartons. I mean, she was just so enthused all the time. And it was infectious because the customers caught it and we as a staff caught it. And it was just really, really fun to get to know her. And that will always be my picture of her in my mind because I never saw her in any other mood. Thanks for sharing about that. So great. So many times when I would stop in at the Spring Lake store, it was for a maintenance issue. And she would bring something up to me and say, isn't this cute? And I'm looking at her. <laughs> I don't really know what cute looks like very well. <laughs> and, uh, isn't this cute? No, I don't know. Sure. <laughs> but she made you believe, too. I mean, she made you believe in whatever that little thing was. Yeah. Anybody else? You need to talk really loud because we're recording, I so. Can do, I can do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. Yeah. Um, I've got probably a lot of stories, but the one most recent is the one that's um, touching to me. I've already told Jay, kind of told Josh, but it, it just means a lot to me. When Melissa was in the hospital, she texted me and she said, hey, do you have time for a phone call? I said, sure. And um, we're talking away about what was going on. And I was choking on tears, and in, in between trying to talk to her and thinking, we just hold it together. For Melissa, just hold it together. And um, she says, hey, she says, this weekend, she says, oh, you want to come over when I'm home? And I said, sure, I, I'd love to. And I knew I, I couldn't hold it no more. I knew I couldn't. And um, I said, crying aloud, well, sure, she says, I've been doing a little bit of that myself. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I let it fly. And, and um, I said, dang it, Melissa. I said, I'm mad. I said, I'm sad. This is so unfair. Oh, I know. I know. I know. And she's like, God, God, yes. And she says, um, she says, this happens, and God does this. And that happens, and God does that. She says, it's truly been amazing to sit back and watch. <laughs> My response is, God, Melissa, it's only you. And I said, that was supposed to rub off on me. <laughs> and she says, oh, it will, Linda. You just wait. You just wait. It, it'll happen. And I said, go on and tell God that you promised that. <laughs> And this is from your uh, in memory of little card here. So if you're looking, I'm going to read, and I'm going to need my glasses to do this because I've been aging lately. I can't see like I used to. But this is the Heidelberg Catechism. And it's traditionally reformed. I find this fascinating. But Rusty wanted this in the, in, in the service. And I think it's really meaningful, especially for those of us left behind to kind of think about. And uh, Rusty, you're not reformed, right? So this is just from Rusty's studies. He ended up, Rusty and Melissa somehow ended up in West Michigan, you know, with all of the reformed people seem to be, not all of them, but quite a few. Um, but this is just good truth, uh, and I want to read it. It's, it's such scriptural truth. It says, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And then it answers that question, that I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus the Christ. He was fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to him. Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him great words. Join me in prayer. God, we come before you, and we don't come before you today on behalf of Melissa because honestly, God, while we're going to dedicate her to you in a certain way at the end of the service, 
what we really need is your care. The Bible calls you the comforter. It calls the Spirit of God the comforter. And I pray that you'd be that for Rusty. I pray that you'd be that for Jake and so many others in this room who are grieving. And sometimes maybe the hurt is even more when we're grieving somebody who's worth grieving. And Melissa is and was worth grieving. And so we ask that you'd be here for this time and that you'd walk with us through this. And not just through this next few moments, but through the next days and weeks and months, especially when I think of this family that's going to grieve this loss. We also recognize the fact that we have a lot to be thankful for. Anybody who knew Melissa Woolley has so much to be thankful for. And so we thank you, God, for creating her. We thank you for blessing us with her and for making her part of our lives. We are richer as human beings because of this woman who walked in our midst. And we thank you because we just don't have, I don't have a doubt in my, in my mind that she is with you right now. And so we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. When I was thinking about what to share, and I don't know, you know, they call these sermons, and I'm not sure this will be, and you can judge for me afterwards whether, well, what it actually is. But I was thinking about words that Melissa had in her life that echoed the Father God. You know, when somebody walks with the Lord as closely as she did, there are things about his character that rubs off on them. I talked to a friend of mine today, and he answered the phone, and he sounds just like his wife. And he says, well, that's true. I've been with her for 20 years. I started to sound like her. And, you know, I think Melissa was with God enough years that she started to sound like him. I really think that. I had a fundraising idea, and we have some board members here, so don't take this to heart. But I told Melissa this at one point. If you're from Birmingham, don't be offended. This is a Michigander's uh, attempt at imitation of a southern accent, which is maybe not so good. But I actually thought, and, and it, this was a joke, but I would say if we could just get Melissa's voice on an app, you know, and that app could wake me up in the morning and wake other people. I bet you we could sell that thing, you know, like, hi, Josh, you're a world beater. Get up, get up. You're, you're going to change everything, you know. She had joy, right? Wouldn't you agree? She had joy, just a gift for it. In Psalm 134, there's this line. It says, this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And I read that verse like it's a pill when I'm hurting. You know, I take a little bit of ibuprofen and I'll feel better. Like, I, I take it like I'm a glass half empty guy and I need to read it to bring my joy level up. I think Melissa read that, that verse and was like, that's me. I got it, you know. This is the day. Every day she woke up and said, this is the day. And I'm here and I'm glad. And all these trinkets in the store that not everybody thought were so valuable, they're incredibly valuable. They're amazing. Let me, let me tell you about them. And she, she just kind of exuded this joyfulness, this gift of joy. And if you were around her, she affected you. I remember sitting in the lobby at Ferry Street one day, this is probably three, four years ago, and while she worked for Mary in the stores, right, uh, my, I think my best recollections of her are still from her role as a receptionist because I saw her interact with clients. And our clients are grieving people sometimes. They walk in with some pain, and that pain sometimes goes for enough years in a row that it affects their personalities, and they may not be happy people. And it was like oil hitting water, you know? It was like darkness when the sun rises, when, when they walked in and, and they'd say, you know, she'd say, how you doing? And they'd say, well, I'm in pain about this, this, and this. And then she would say that line, what, who said it? Jesus loves you, just that little line, Jesus loves you. And somehow when she said it, you could feel the joy just coming from her and into their lives. And it was just a game changer. I won't ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you have read the news in the last year, year and a half? How many of you have watched the news? And I'm not going to ask whether you're watching CNN, Fox News, or something else. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. Tell Craig. He goes to Harvest. He knows the answer for that. But I don't. I don't have any idea. But you've read the news. You've watched the news. And every time we look at one of these sources, it's a list of what's gone wrong, right? Just honestly, a couple of years ago, I remember reading about this virus, and it was in China, and you know, everybody's like, "Well, it won't ha affect anybody," but you know, kind of did just a little bit, right? And then the next day, you might read something, and it says there's a meteor on the other side of the moon, and it's going to land somewhere in the Pacific, and that never happens. And then you're going to read about Russia and what they're doing. Then you're going to read about Ferrisburg and what they're doing. And you know what those news job, those news people's job is, is to make us afraid, right? The, the antidote, the antidote for being afraid is joy. And Melissa had this ability to just shine in the middle of all that stuff. And one of the things I think about her is if we 
could stop watching some of those news sources, or at least taking them to heart quite so much, and listen to what was happening in her heart and her head. When she heard the words, this is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice, and I will be glad in it. You know, Paul, years later, will write in the New Testament, in the, in the book of Philippians, again and again and again. And he writes especially in chapter 4 to anxious people, and I might be one of those some days. One of my friends today told me that three years ago I had more hair than I have now. Um, you know, it's true, because anxiety does some stuff to you, right? Well, rejoicing is the cure for that. And Paul says it out loud. He says, Rejoice, rejoice. Again, I say to you, rejoice. And if you're anxious, start thanking God and notice that Jesus is near and let your gentleness be known to all. And then he says, with prayer or with thanksgiving, let your petitions be known to the Father. And he says, you don't have to sit in this anxiety. This joy is the cure. Sometimes I think Melissa was just a little bit of that cure that we need in our daily life, embodied in a human being. And I think she echoed one of the very characteristics of God. When you're watching CNN and when you're watching Fox News or whatever you're watching, maybe you should just stop watching altogether, but that's just me. Whatever you're watching, one of the things you need to know is God's not losing his joy. I think God gets angry. I think, quite honestly, I've even made him angry. I've lived my life in such a way that a few times I've grieved him and I've hurt him and I've had to ask for forgiveness and I've come back to him after moments when I got a little bit lost. So I don't think God's just somebody who, you know, kind of walks around joyful every day in the sense we might think about it that way. He might have other emotions, but every one of his thoughts comes from a heart of joy. And Melissa echoed that joy. I knew that because when I was in the ICU and they were giving her the worst diagnosis I think anybody in my life has ever received. Honestly, it was that bad. She still shone. It was just like effervescent light walking into her room. She was the happiest person in that room. Plenty of days I was there, right? She was, she was the one cheering everybody else up. So the first word I thought of when I thought of her was joy, and I just wanted to echo that from Psalm 134. The next word is faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, The faith is being sure of what, of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is one of those words that is misused a lot in our day, right? Sometimes people believe they can kind of just believe for anything and it'll take place, and that doesn't happen. I've tried it. I prayed for years for a Maserati, and I did not drive here in a Maserati. <laughs> doesn't work. But when God says something, when he finally speaks into your life, I think faith is often kind of like a surrender to whatever he's saying. When I was almost 17 years of age, I, I am a Baptist preacher's kid. I, my dad was a pastor just... Not, not across the street where Craig pastors, but across the other street, past that, okay? So I grew up in the church, and I remember I was almost 17 years of age. I was sitting in a room, and I was about ready to be done with this thing called Christianity. I just thought, it's, it's just not real. And sitting in this room, all of a sudden, I felt that I was not alone, and I wasn't. There was 900 other kids. There was a big room. There were a lot of people there. But there was something beyond all that. I experienced some moment, I'm not saying everybody experiences it like this, but there was somebody speaking to me, and I realized in that moment I had a choice. And for the first time in my life, I heard God say something. I won't say I heard the words, it wasn't written on a wall anywhere, but I heard, I love you. Somewhere in Melissa's life, she heard those words. She heard that Jesus loved her. And then she had this choice about whether to surrender to those words and all that it might mean, and honestly, it meant a lot, and she did. And you could see it in her life. Her faith grew from that moment. She surrendered to the little bit. The, the Bible says that faith comes from hearing the word, and the word comes from this kind of deep place where God kind of speaks it into our lives through the scriptures. She read those words from the scriptures, and she internalized them. She, she took them into her life, and she decided to believe in a way that is... Honestly, I think rare. A few years ago, I, I was going through a hard time, and she looked at me and she said, what's wrong? I went by the front desk of Ferry, and she just asked that simple question. And somehow the way she asked it was different. She's a cheerful person, but she knew something was wrong, and it really was. And I couldn't even tell her what was wrong. It was one of those things I didn't want to talk about. But in the middle of that, she said, I'm going to pray for you. And because she had listened to Jesus at one point in her life, and that had started to internalize inside of her, I'm going to tell you, when she prayed for things, she was surrendering to what God was already saying. And you could feel it when she prayed for you. It was, you'd been prayed for, literally. You know what I mean? Like, she was taking what you were and putting it before the Father in heaven. If you don't think this works, a few years ago, I was thinking, I, 
I was thinking back, to probably when I was in college, I was in school studying theology, and I had this guy in my dorm who was truly terrifying. He was a scary guy, and he was in pastoral training. And when I got to know him well enough that I said one day, I said, why are you here? Why are, why are you getting trained? He's like, I know, I have no business being a pastor, but God, one day I was listening to this thing, and God told me, I'm supposed to be a pastor. So I'm here, and I'm going to learn about it. And, and he said, would you pray for me? I'm going to be a pastor. And that was in 1994, in the fall of 1994. And wouldn't you know it, five or six months ago, I looked online, and of course we're Facebook friends, and that guy preached his first sermon five or six months ago. You know, there's something about God who will speak something into our past, and then he'll work it out into our future. And in the middle, to believe what he has said and to hold it, not all of those things come true in 10 minutes or an hour or a day. Sometimes they take years. But Melissa had this sense that God was at work in her life. And she got that sense because she heard him back here, and then she started to watch him. And what she was saying to you, Rita, in that phone call was, God's got this. Even as she sat in that hospital room, her faith in Jesus was not just strong. I think it was actually growing stronger. And I suspect it's because God was meeting her in that moment because she had a real walk with him. She had really submitted her life to the scriptures and she had really said, this is what I'm about. And somehow in the middle of that, she was able to communicate faith to so many of the rest of us who, honestly, it was a really challenging moment for people grieving her, her coming loss. Faith is a big deal. Faith is something that changes our life. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And Melissa's words and kind of focus on surrendering to what God had said in her life made all the difference. And you and I probably got to witness that. The third thing that I noticed about her, and I'm personally touched by that, and this is a dangerous word to use because we misuse it all the time, but you'll agree with me that Melissa was a loving person. And I thought about that. I have officiated dozens of funerals, just to be honest, maybe hundreds. But at the end of the day, when somebody in that service that, that you're, you're walking through their life and remembering like we're doing today, when you feel loved by them, it affects you in a very different sense than when you show up and you're just issuing those words. And I thought, am I going to be able to get through this service? Because I'll tell you, I felt loved by Melissa. I mean, honestly, she was somebody who, if you were near her, she made you feel loved. Now, she loved Rusty, and that was this marital love. She loved Jake, that's her son. and she loved, But she loved people she'd never even met. Rusty, I hope you don't mind me telling this story, but Rusty and Melissa were in New Orleans, remember this story. Um, they were in New Orleans a few years ago, and they were at kind of a party, uh, and the, the street was full, and they were trying to get into a restaurant, and every seat in the restaurant was full. And they said, that's fine, we'll eat at the bar. No, no, no space at the bar. So finally, they're standing up eating, and this cop who's at the bar comes over to them, and he, he kind of tried to kick you out, right? Yeah. He said, you can't stand up. It's like the fire marshal put a certain occupancy on this room, and you can't be here and just standing up. you got to actually sit down or leave. And, he, and Rusty said, I, I'm ready to leave. But Melissa starts talking to the guy. And guess what? He gave her seat, to his, his seat to her. And in five minutes, they're sitting down eating, and this guy who was going to kick them out is like their best friend. You know, when you have the gift of taking the love of Jesus that's happened in your life, and then putting it out there in front of others, things change around you. Not everybody responds like that cop, by the way. But I have watched Melissa love people that many would think of as unlovable. I have watched somebody walk in in grief and in stubbornness and in grumpiness even and have her love just shape, shape their whole day in a different direction and change who they are. I think I've experienced that myself. Love is a big deal. I was reading uh, a few years ago and I came across this quote. It's by Dr. Kurt Thomas, who's a psychologist. He says, after years of therapy, he said, I have come to the belief that everyone is born looking for someone who is looking for them. Now, if you didn't catch that the first time, let me repeat it. He says that everyone is born looking for someone who is looking for them. That means when a baby's born, they look around Maybe this is a little more metaphorically true, but eventually it's really true. They're born looking for somebody who is expecting them, somebody who is hoping that they're arriving, somebody who's going to give them their first meal, somebody who's going to make sure they've got a crib to fall asleep in that night, somebody who's going to swaddle their little bodies in those clothes that we all put them in. We're all born looking for somebody who's looking for us. And one of the things about love and action is we're there for people who I suspect, when they looked around for the person who was supposed to look for them, they didn't see the people they should have. 
Maybe it's a mom who wasn't really expecting that child and they were grieving, not just hopeful. Maybe it's a dad who wasn't there. Maybe it's some other broken pattern in their life. But when we look at our clients and maybe when we look at ourselves, what we're looking at is people who are expecting love and not finding it. Melissa had the ability to take the love of Jesus, and this is what I think Jesus did so well. He loved people who didn't know who was looking for them. When they walked into the room with Christ, just picture the woman at the well in John chapter 4, the woman in John chapter 8, or the guys as they're fishing, you know. They were looking for somebody looking for them, and they were thinking, maybe nobody's ever going to look for me. And then they saw Jesus. Melissa had the ability to take that little look and turn it into something for every client she came into contact with. And maybe it wasn't just clients. Maybe it was volunteers and staff and board members and whoever else. Because we all need that bit of love. The scriptures tell us that Jesus loves that way. In fact, he says that we're, if we are truly his disciples, we are to be known by our love. He took that love and he decided for you and for me that he was willing to die on a cross for us, right? And that wasn't enough. I mean, the cross, that was something. But the resurrection, now that's where it really happened. Every time I face an insurmountable challenge, every time I look at our budget, every time I look at a client that I don't, two days ago I was looking at a young woman who was homeless, and I'm thinking, what are we going to do? And then I remember that there's an empty grave, and that the Son of God decided to love us and be the people, or be the person who we needed, who noticed where we were when we had no one looking at us in the eternal sense. Melissa, at some point in her life, came to the realization that there was a God up here, and when she was born looking for somebody who was looking for them, every human being let them down at some point. Maybe you'd agree that the human beings in your life let you down, right? Maybe some of those people who you thought should be looking for you stopped looking a while back. Maybe your kids don't call. Maybe your spouse is distracted. I don't know. I don't want to think about it even. But all of us have to come to the place where we come into contact with a God in heaven who is the ultimate one looking for us, who is the ultimate one who is looking at the people inside of this earth who absolutely are a little bit lost, a little bit unloved, a little bit broken. That's me, that's you. And Melissa had this ability to just kind of hear what God thought and feel herself to be so loved, and then she just overflowed in it. It's, you know, John chapter 4, he actually says that if you get this little bit of water flowing in your life, it'll go from here to overflowing, and then it'll overflow into other people's lives, and Melissa lived that life. When she asked that little children, do you, that little child, do you love Jesus? Just picture that. She had this simple faith. I have a degree in theology, and I gotta tell you, tell you uh, halfway through, I think I'm pretty tired of theology. And if theology could look, and I know it's important, but if theology could look like Melissa Woolley, M- Melissa Woolley saying, Josh, do you love Jesus today? Do you love him today? And do you know he loves you today? We should have put that on the app. We should have just had it for everybody. Because <laughs> she had this gift of simple faith that just fused with joy, and then she could love anybody, literally anybody. I want to pray for you, and I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to have just a little bit of a second part to this service because what I believe is that it's helpful to dedicate Melissa. And there's part of her that's staying here, right? There's part of her that won't leave the earth. And then there's a part of her that's left already, and she's not here. The real person, the the human being we love, the spirit, the soul, whatever we want to call it, that is no longer here, and she's with her Father in heaven, and she's loved. But I want to pray for you because in every crowd of people, whether it's one at the place where I work, or whether it's a church I speak, or whether it's a street corner I stand on, anywhere you want to go, you find that people are hurting, and people don't know how much they're loved, and they don't know there's this God who absolutely wants to be a part of their life. And Melissa just loved to communicate that message. And I want to pray for you, and if you're in one of those places, even if you know him today, I'm not, I'm not even saying you're not a Christian or wherever you are with Jesus, but if you're in a place where you're just kind of going, I'm searching and I'm not sure what to do with this, I want to just pray for you before we move on. And then we're going to walk through this time where we dedicate her body to this earth and her spirit, more importantly, to heaven, because that's where she is. So join me in prayer. God, Melissa just flowed with your spirit in a way that was powerful and there are gifts all across this room there are capabilities and uh, things that in the same way that Melissa echoed your character 
we have things about us that echo yours as well. And you want to work inside of us. And that joy, that faith, that love that she had was her. But God, you want to pour that love into every one of us and to follow you, to listen to you, to understand that the, the Father in heaven wants to speak into every one of our hearts and that all of that brokenness, all of those failures, that you want to take them away. God, I just want to ask in the name of Jesus that you'd speak into our lives, that you want to do that here and now. And that you want to do that regardless of where we're at and where we've come from. And frankly, you want to do this regardless of whether we go to church every Sunday of our lives or whether we're, we're still searching for what Melissa found. It's not just a belief system. It's a person. It's not just a, a, a religion. It's a God who absolutely cares, who knows each one of his children, and who Melissa had rock-solid faith in as she came to the end of her life and now is even more joyfully experiencing in heaven with you. And so, God, I pray for that. I just pray that you would speak into our lives and that you would minister to us. And for Rusty and for Jake and for others who are grieving in this family, God, I pray that you'd meet them in the midst of this and that you'd walk with them through it. But, God, the great scandal of our world isn't even all those things we'd read about on a news site. It's actually that we don't know how much you love us. And somehow, all of the unlove in our world communicates a message to us that's broken and untrue. And that's that we're not cared for, that there's nobody looking for us when we're born looking for that person. You've decided to be that person. You've decided to love the human race. You've decided to send your son for us. You've decided to die and to pay for everything we've done wrong and for everything that we ever will do wrong. And you want to give us new life. And so, God, I ask for that. I ask for that message to embed itself in our hearts. And I pray that we'd wake up knowing that this is the day the Lord has made and that we can absolutely have faith in things that we can never see, but we know eventually in the next life we will. And we can absolutely be loving in this sense that Melissa absolutely lived out. God, you are love. You are light. You are the God who speaks, who we surrender to and give our hearts to. And so, God, we pray that you'd meet us now in this. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Just a last little part here. And again... I think this is helpful. Hopefully you will as well. It used to be that we would travel to a graveside at this part of the service, and sometimes we still do. Sometimes there are committals, and I think there's something meaningful about the fact that God who's created us has made us physical, right? You know, some of you hugged me when we walked in the door, and when we hugged, we actually touched. You can feel the physicality there, but that stops in this moment. Melissa left that. That physical part of her is still here. And so we're committing that to this earth. And then we're committing her spirit to the God who loves her. And so we're, we're going to act like kind of we're at a graveside, committing her to this earth and committing her spirit to Jesus. And I'm going to read a little bit of scripture on the way to that. This is from 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17. It says, according to the Lord's own word, we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with that trumpet, the call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord. We will be with the Lord forever. I'm going to crack thinking about that. Join me as we just commit her life to the, the God who loves her. Spirit of the living God, creator of life, father of mankind, and of our Lord Jesus Christ, we commit back to nature all that which is natural, and to the grave only that which the grave can hold. To you we commit Melissa's spirit, trusting in your love, your wisdom, and your power. Please comfort your servants whose hearts are full, and grant that we may so love and serve you in this life, that together with your loved ones we may all obtain the fullness of your promise in this world and the world to come, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray these things in that name, which is above every name. Amen. That concludes our service for today. Thank you for coming. If you want to greet Rusty and Jake and any of the other members of the family, you can come to the front before you leave. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it.